daughter Marley, still in the hospital. I saw uh, Keith Wilkins this past week, and a lot of you will remember him from Martha's Menu, and uh, I was talking to him, and uh, I could tell by looking in his eyes, they, were, they are physically worn out uh, from just the trips, many trips back and forth, and just staying over there basically in Memphis Hospital. So uh, let's continue to remember Marley, Will Banks in her prayers, and also remember the whole family, because this, uh, this has been a lot of stress on them. Let's remember their whole family through this. Butch Parnell, let's continue to remember him, Brother Tracy Newman. Uh, we've got several more to remember, Sister uh, Marilyn Dillman, Daniel Threadgill. Uh, Don Nunley's out sick today. He's always here on Sunday, so let's uh, keep in our, in our prayers. Sister Beverly Thrasher's mother, Geneva, is uh, not doing well. And uh, she's, uh, she's got a lot of issues. Of course, she's, got, she's aged, you know. She's got some age on her also. But any, anything is trouble when you get a lot of age on you. And she's uh, hurt. Well, she just needs a touch. She really does. She just she's got more than I could tell you about this morning. But she really needs a touch. So let's remember uh, her in our prayers. Her name is Geneva Putts. Many of you will know Geneva. So let's remember her in our prayers. Anyone else have a request this morning? Remember Sister Gail's nephew? Anyone else? All right, let's remember the Wheeler family, their loss. Anyone else have a request? Let's remember our service. I'm looking forward to a great day in the Lord, but it'll be whatever we put into it, so let's put everything we got into it and see what the Lord will do for us today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, Brother Josh. Lord, we're so thankful for this day and your blessings. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come to your house. We seek for your will to be carried out in this service today. Allow your power to fill this room and let it speak into our hearts. Allow us to understand the word that is spoken, taught to us today. Lord, I ask that you allow our worship and praise to be exactly what you want it to be. And Lord, I'm asking that you just minister to every need that is here in this place. God, I ask that you move to these requests that's been called out, the unspoken request and all the hearts that are here, the troubles that are in the minds of the people. Lord, I ask that you just minister as only you can. Show us favor, Lord, and let us find uh, your will in our lives. We'll give you praise for it in Jesus' name. get your Sunday school offering out. If you have Sunday school uh, offering this morning, these uh, nice ushers will take their take your offering up today. Brother Joey Gilmore's got a birthday today, 61 years old. He don't look 61, does he? Give him a big hand for 61 years. 61, Brother Joey, that's pretty good. <clears throat> Sister Adrian says she hopes she looked good as Brother Joey did when she was 61. I hope she does too. Happy birthday, Brother Joey. Well, we've been talking about figs for the last three Sundays, and guess what? We're not going to talk about figs this Sunday. So we're changing up just a little bit, and uh, I'm not sure when Brother Hodum's coming back. Maybe next week or so. I'm not sure. He's getting a little closer uh, to being back in town, so whenever he gets back, we'll, we'll let him uh, take over this and uh, continue to teach. But um, I'm glad you showed up again this morning to hear what I've got to say. Brother Rogers, can you come up here just a minute? I don't, you may not can get up here, find out how you wait to get up here. You may have to go around here and look at him. Isn't he a good looking dude this morning? Y'all love Brother Rogers. Some people do. <laughs> Y'all remember what he preached on last time he preached? Preached on the blood, didn't you? and the life-saving uh, food and uh, nourishment that's in the blood and what, it, what the blood does to us. But I was just, I was thinking about Brother Rogers this morning, what a good-looking guy he was. And, 
His hair. Don't be lying in church house. <laughs> his hair is all fixed up and nice suit of clothes. And he's sharp, isn't he? He's looking good this morning. Don't be lying. Does that, <laughs> does that make you feel good, brother? When somebody brags on you? Oh, yeah. yeah. Makes Even though it's true or not. It makes, still makes you smile, doesn't it? That's right. Yeah. yeah. You can go sit down now. I just wanted to prove to you how much that people like to be bragged on. They like to hear a praise and a pat on the back every once in a while. Let me read to you uh, a little quick insert before I get started this morning and tell you what my lesson is on. In 1948, the UCLA men's basketball team was 12 and 13. That means they won 12 and they lost 13. It's not a good record. Hoping to turn things around, they hired a young coach named John Wooden. Anybody ever heard of John Wooden? He has spent the last two years coaching at Indiana State University. He made an immediate impact at UCLA, coaching the team to a division title and a 22-7 and record his first year. Won 27, lost 7. More wins than they had ever had in the season. He did even better the next year helping his team to secure another division title to 24 and seven. He went on to become the greatest coach in college basketball history, leading the UCLA team that had only lost 12, or only won 12 games the year before he got there to 10 national championships in 12 years, including seven in a row and a record 88 game winning streak. It's not because he always had the most talented players. Some of his teams were only modestly talented, talented or even notable weakness. Yet year after year, he managed to raise the level of their play and get them to perform at a championship level when it mattered the most. So what was it about his coaching or teaching style that led him to unprecedented success? Was it his masterful use of praise or his strategic use of criticism or maybe both? Psychologist Ronald Tharp and Ronald Gailmore had to know. So for the next 15 practices, and from 1974 to 1975, they sat, observed, and systematically tracked Wooden's specific coaching behaviors. <clears throat> so how much was the praise and how much was the criticism? Very little, actually. Just over 50% of Wooden's behavior was pure instructions, specific statements about what to do or how to do it. No judgment, no approval, no disapproval, just information. The most frequent, the next most frequent thing occurring was what John Wooden called hustle. And it was sometimes yelled out in drive harder, move faster, hustle. The next most frequent thing they noted was his unique feedback technique. This was designed to make it clear that he wasn't satisfied, but followed by the immediate reminder of the correct way of doing it. For example, he, how many times do I have to tell you to follow through with your head when you're shooting? I've been telling some of you for three years now, do not wind up to throw the ball, pass it from your chest. So altogether, 75% of Wooden's teaching techniques contain specific information geared to providing the athlete with a clearer picture of what to do. The researchers felt that this was a major contributor to his coaching success, and it makes perfect sense. After all, simply knowing that something is good or bad is not especially helpful if you don't know what exactly should be repeated or changed the next time. Wooden's modeling formula was, is very interesting. When Wooden saw something he didn't like, he stopped practice and corrected it immediately and executed the correct technique. This only took five seconds at the most, but it was clear expectations. But it was clear what his expectations were. A one-sentence summary of John Wooden practice sessions. They asked him, and he said, "Well, you can't let praise or criticism get to you. It's a weakness to get caught up into either one." Now I'm going to talk to you this morning about the value of criticism and the danger of praise the value of criticism, and the danger of praise. How many of y'all have ever been criticized for something? If you hadn't, you'd never try to do nothing. 
Well, everything you try to do, somebody's going to be critical f for it. They're going to know how to do it a little better than you did or know what you should have done. Uh, first of all, they don't understand the motive behind it. They don't understand why you're doing it. They don't even understand most of the story most of the time. But they're willing to give you their two cents worth even though they can't afford to get rid of it. But they will give you their two cents on anything. Uh, people see you and they make a decision based only on what they know and never, they're not short on opinions. But as Christians, we need to be careful on how we praise and how we criticize. Well, we really just don't need to criticize anybody. Uh, it's, if our motive is to tear someone down, we've got the wrong motive altogether. We're in the building up process. The Word of God will do the, the dividing but it's not up to us to do that. It's not up to us to criticize. But I promise you, if you've ever tried to do something, you're going to be criticized for it. There'll be some criticism along with it. Theodore Roosevelt, all of us have heard of this man. Probably none of y'all never met him. Hopefully you hadn't. Theodore Roosevelt said, it is not the critic who counts. It's not the man who points out how the strong man stumbled or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by the dust and the sweat and the blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in the worthy cause, the one who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly." so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Now this is what I've already said, always said. I'd rather fail doing something as I had succeeded at doing nothing. I'd rather, I'd rather fail at trying to do something than succeed and do nothing. What about you? If we're not careful, we get involved, very involved, in people's failures and their shortcomings, and we never recognize the hard work, the sweat and tears, uh, the, the devotion that has went into all of that. So this morning I want to talk about consider the value of criticism and the danger of praise. This will be complicated for some of you to understand and some of you to get a hold of. I'm not take, telling you to take the whole dose today. I'm just telling you to listen and then see what, it, see what you feel like in a week or two after this. Uh, trouble with most of us, and this is me included, uh, would rather be ruined by praise than be saved by criticism. You saw how Brother Rogers was smiling when he was up here? I was loading the praise on him. And I was trying to think of something specific that I could talk about. His last message, maybe, that, uh, that would make him know that I remembered something about what he'd done. I, build, I was building him up. But oftentimes, uh, we, uh, we receive praise and we think criticism would be harmful. Actually, the criticism might be a little more helpful sometimes than the praise. Uh, the world we live in, as everybody knows, has got a chip on their shoulder. They, everybody's daring somebody to knock it off just about it. They're stressed and depressed and oppressed and all these other kind of press, they're, all, they're stressed out. And everybody's dealing with something. Everybody's got a problem. It may be different than what yours is, but everybody's got a problem. And to them, it's just as real as yours is. It's just as big as yours is. Uh, and it's important when someone lashes out that we understand that they're not lashing out at us personally. It's probably got something to do with what they're going through at that present time. About 85 or 90 percent of the people has got good intentions. They really do. They're not just out to get us. Sincere criticism, however, can benefit us sometimes more than praise. Uh, being overly praised will cause pride to build up. <clears throat> and I'll tell you an example of this. It's the human nature to enjoy praise and pats on the back. And we should get, we should get pats on the back when we have done good. Uh, but here's the problem when you get too many pats on the back. As you start leaving God out of the equation, you start feeling like that you can uh, do this on your own. Well, I was successful at it this time, so I, you know, I, I probably don't need him as much as I actually thought I did. I'm a little better than I thought of. You know, I'd rather have people patting me on my back as I had criticizing. 
I'd rather have somebody telling me you can play the piano good than you're a terrible piano player. That's human nature. I'd rather have somebody telling me, well, you taught a good lesson this morning instead of that was the worst lesson I ever heard of. That's human nature. But if we're not careful, we get caught up in the praise, and sometimes that becomes a prideful situation. So first let me deal with the danger of praise to start with and the chemistry of how this works. Uh, the Bible is for correction and reproof, and I'll tell you the verse here in just a moment, but there's a lot of areas in the Bible that will build you up. And uh, if you will look at it and read the Bible with a good conscience and pray that you'll have a clear understanding, there'll be several verses in the Bible that teaches us uh, what we're doing is good. A good name is rather to be chosen. A virtuous woman is far above rubies. I mean, all these are admiration and praise for things that we believe in and think about. And we read those, and then we come across those places where it's constructive to us, and we would like to skip over those things sometimes. Actually, it's probably more valuable than the praise is to us. David says, the Bible is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So what this does, the Bible does, is actually shows you your feet, and then it shows you the path. That way you'll know where to put your foot. And that's, uh, that's very important. Second Timothy says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make the wise unto salvation through faith with, which is in Jesus Christ. And then verse 16 says this, All scripture, all scripture, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So there's a time when the Word of God will build us up, and there'll be time of corrections that we need to take from the Word of God. And when I'm talking about you receiving criticism and praise from different folks, it is never our place, folks, as Christian people, to try to tear someone down through, through the Word of God. I see this happening sometimes, and it kind of bothers me that how somebody would use the Scriptures in such an abusive manner. The Scripture was never designed to abuse mankind. The Scripture is designed to help us become better people in our walk with the Lord. And when we use the Scripture as a club... That's not, the right, that's not the right perspective. It, the Bible says that the, the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It'll divide. It'll separate. But you don't have to use it as a club. Uh, truth is, is none of us have heard well done yet. None of us have heard that. We're on the way. We think we're, we're saved, and we hope we're in a saved condition. But truthfully, none of us has heard him say well done yet. So... Uh, we teach and preach uh, to do our best, in which I believe we should do our best in everything we do. I don't think anything short of our best will work for the work of God. Uh, but when people start, when you start doing your best, and then you start getting good results, we have to be careful that we don't take pride in those results, but we give the honor and glory to the Lord. It's not us that, that do it. And there's nothing wrong with us exceeding and excelling in the things that we do. I think we should. Everything we put our hands to, I think we should give it our very best shot and do our very best thing. So it's not a bad thing if someone tells you that you're doing a good job when you've done a good job. That's all right. But there is a danger of receiving too much praise and not enough criticism. And sometimes we decide this without really knowing that we're doing it. And we start thinking, well, our confidence starts building is what happens to us. And we start thinking, somebody says, hey, you've done, you done a good job, Brother Rogers, preaching other Wednesday night. Or Keith, you've done a good job teaching other Sunday morning. And I start thinking about that, and I was like, well, you know, I did do a pretty good job, come to think of it. You know, that was, pretty, that was a pretty good lesson I'd done. 
And before long, we start weeding out God and we start looking for just the pats on the back. Let me tell you, without the Lord, we're nothing. We're zero. And I realized that this morning, that without the Lord, I cannot do anything. We've got the next breath. We've got barred. This, this is not us, but this is the Lord's deal. And we, we need to promote the Lord. I've seen people uh, receive glory and praise and people build people up only for the feet to fall out from under them shortly after. The Bible teaches us that I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Now, we get put a lot of emphasis on I. If you ever see anybody that's quoting this verse and using this verse, they're fired up about, I can do all things. I can do all things through Christ that strengthened me. And it goes down after they say, I. Which really the emphasis should be through Christ. It's not, it really shouldn't be on the I part. I can do all things through Christ. That's where the emphasis need to be placed. Because the Bible teaches us that he's the vine and we're the branches. And without him, we ain't nothing. Without him, we ain't nothing. It's in him that we move and live and have our being. That's what the Bible says. One of my bosses told me one time, said, You're never as good as you think you are, but you're never as bad as others say you are. That's pretty good. You're never as good as you think you are, but you're never as bad as others, others say you are. My dad was a preacher. Most of you remember my dad. He's been gone for 22 years now. And he told this story, so I'm, I'm not reserved in about telling it to you. Uh, but when dad first started preaching, now he was a good preacher. He was a real good, he was a fireball preacher, you that remember him. Uh, and not only did he preach it, he lived what he preached. I mean, it was day in from the time he woke up until he went to bed. That's, that's what he done. He done it the way it was supposed to be done because I was there. I would have knew it if he hadn't. I was around him a lot. But he was, uh, he was man, he was a good preacher. I mean, he was a fireball preacher. And, but he told the story that when he first started preaching, and he started preaching when he was like 16 years old, I think, uh, before he even had a car to drive. And for the summer vacations, uh, a lot of times that he would get in during the school year, he would catch a bus and go up to Illinois and preach several places up in Illinois when he was a young, just a young preacher, you know, 17 or 18 years old. He would go up there and spend a couple of weeks and stay in the church there and uh, just basically live in the church and preach every night. And he told this story about when he first went up there. They were, he was new and uh, they were new to him. But he just, got, he just fell in there and preached, you know, just like he always did. Preached and preached and preached and preached his heart out. And uh, he said after church was over, he said uh, there was people coming up there and talking to him. Man, he was, he was the next, you know, the big time preacher, the next big TV preacher. And they was just, we've never heard such good preaching in all of our life. We've, we have never heard such good preaching. Of course, he took it with a grain of salt, but the next night he got back up there and he poured his soul out again. Again, the congregation came up and was just loathing over him how well that he could preach and how well he delivered the message and how much they got out of it and just no telling where he was going in his preaching. And he said as a young man that he thought, well, you know, maybe I am. Maybe I am doing really good. You know, before he was kind of had an humble spirit about him. But he said, you know, I got to thinking, well, look, this is, you know, I poured it on him. And he said, this is his words. This is not me saying this. I didn't, I didn't know him at that age, okay? He said, uh, I got to thinking to myself the next day, you know, I'll give y'all two nights. And if you think I've put it on y'all those two nights, you just wait till tonight. I'm fixing to, I'm fixing to put a message on you like you ain't never heard before. He said, I didn't pray a lot. I already had a message kind of lined out. And he said, I didn't pray, didn't study much that day. And he said, I come in there bouncing in the door that night like I owned the place. Couldn't wait to get up there and preach because I had something for them people that they were, they were never going to forget. And he said, I got up there and he said, I had no more and started until there was nothing there. No anointing there nothing 
He said, you're talking about somebody dropping the watermelon. He said, I dropped the watermelon that night. He said, I couldn't get nothing out of my mouth. Nothing would come to me. No scriptures. He said, I stayed up there about 15, 20 minutes, and he said, I walked down off the stage with my head down, discouraged. And he said that the next day, you didn't have to worry about him praying and studying. And he said ever since then, he learned a valuable lesson that night. Too much praise can build us up with pride till we think that we don't need the Lord anymore. That's a dangerous place for us. During the battle in the Civil War, the Union Sergeant John Sedgwick was inspecting his troops, and at one point he came through an open area and gazed out toward the enemy's line. He more than glared at them for about five seconds, five to ten seconds. His officer suggested, Sir, it is unwise to glare at the enemy when you are so exposed to them. Nonsense, snapped the general. They couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. A moment later, General, General Sedgwick fell to the ground, fatally wounded. Too much exposure right in front of the enemy. And pride will kill us, thinking we can do something without God. It, it can get us. I love the song that says, To God be the glory. I owe it all to you, whatever I am or whatever I ever hope to be. It's, it's only because of the Lord. Uh, God wisely designed the human body to where you can't hardly pat yourself on the back and you can't hardly kick yourself in the seat of the pants. He designed you that way. Now, before the day's over, some of y'all are going to try that, especially some of you guys. But the human body is designed to where you can't hardly pat yourself on the back and you can't kick yourself in the seat of the pants. A young woman asked for an appointment with a pastor one time, and she said, Sir, you've been preaching on the besetting sins, and I know what mine is. The pastor said, Well, confession, they say, is good for the soul. The woman said, Well, when I come to church, I look around at the congregation and realize that I'm the prettiest one in the church. Nobody else compares to my beauty. And I know it's the sin of pride. The pastor said, no, ma'am, it's not the sin of pride. It's the spirit of deception. Sometimes we think we're a lot hotter than what we are. Sometimes we think we're a lot better looking than what we are. The Bible talks about the man that looks in the mirror, and when he walks away, he forgets what he even looked at. He may be ugly and crook nose and snaggle tooth, look in the mirror and say, man, that's a rough looking guy, but when you walk out, you just forget what you all, forget what you looked at. Brother Perkins, many of you remember Brother Perkins and his preaching. He was a wide open fireball too, wasn't he? But he, uh, he said, never get too puffed up when you're a Christian, but don't ever get too puffed down either. Never get too puffed up, but don't get too puffed down. Now, I was hesitant. I'm going to run out of time if I don't get to the criticism part. But let me, just, let me just direct your attention to something in the Bible on pride. If you want to see the ultimate pride, if you'll read in Job, the 41st chapter, uh, you'll see about a breathing, fire-breathing sea dragon. A lot of y'all didn't know dragons were in the Bible. I don't know if this was a real dragon or if it was a mythical pr uh, creature that they talked about. But they got a lot of descriptions in there about how he breathed fire out of his nose. His heart was hard as stones. Uh, you couldn't penetrate his scales. The scales were so thick together. Uh, he was just about he was just about unstoppable. This was a fire-breathing dragon. If you don't believe it, you read the chapter uh, 41 in the book of Job. But the last verse kind of caps it off, and it says, He beholdeth all things. He is a king over all the children of pride, and God destroyed him. You remember the rich man in the Bible when he walked out one day and he maybe had his shoulders squared back and his hands under his suspenders and he looked over there and said, man, all that corn just as far as I can see is mine. Looked over this way and said, all that wheat just as far as I can see out through there is mine. 
And he looked at his uh, big hay fields around, and he had the cattle on the ever hay field, and just as far as he could see. Man, that's mine. That's a lot of stuff. He looked down at his barns, and maybe the hay was sticking out of the sides of the barns, and it was just so much in the barn. He thought, man, that barn is, that barn is weak compared to the riches I've got. I know what I'm going to do. I'll just tear them down, build me some greater barns. I'll build me some bigger barns. And then I'll say to my soul, just, man, take it easy. You've got it made. Take it easy. And the Lord said, that's it. That's how quick we can step out of this walk of life. When the Lord looks at us and said, it's your time. It's over. I don't care what you've accumulated down here. That's it. It's goodbye. All right, so let me get to this criticism thing, the value of criticism. There's two different kinds of criticism. It's what they say, constructive criticism and destructive criticism. I can just tell you, if you're receiving the criticism, one of them don't make any difference. They're still just as rough as the other one. Constructive or destructive criticism, it hurts just as much. Uh, it is never, should never, ever be our intention to tear someone down with criticism. But there will be criticism come our way if you try to do anything for the Lord. Do you know why? Because that is one of the devil's biggest weapons is discouragement. And he starts that by having someone criticize you. And it'll get you discouraged. Even at your best, it will get you discouraged. As a woman said, granddaddy asked a woman one time, said, lady, are you a Christian? She said, well, I am if everybody leave me alone. But everybody ain't going to leave us alone, are they? They're not going to leave you alone. Jesus was speaking to his disciples. He says, it is impossible to think that offenses won't come. They're going to come. We're going to get some criticism. Here's a good rule of thumb for you. If criticism passes through the filter of the scriptures and you still feel offended, we need to repent. That's constructive criticism. If somebody critique is actually healthy if it don't kill you in the process. Proverbs 15 and 31 says, The ear that heareth the reproof of life abideth among the wise. He that refuseth instruction despises his own soul, but he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Remember, never has God one time called or appointed anyone into the field of criticism. We're to build each other up. We're to encourage each other. Uh, that's not our job. Let the Word of God do what it's supposed to do. Let it take care of its course, and let's live like we're supposed to. And we're going to get criticism, but we don't need to dish out any criticism. You can tell them what the Word of God says to you without clubbing them down, without beating them down. Encourage each other, because you don't know when the next time you're the one that's going to be under the load. It'll happen to all of us. We all through go, go through discouraging times. Let me read real quickly. Galatians 6 and 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now, I would like to take this verse and go out on the streets of Corinth and tell every Pentecostal Long-haired woman and every short-haired Pentecostal man, this verse loud and clear, because I see so much pride amongst our Pentecostal ranks now because that we have got the Spirit of God dwelling on the inside of us, and it has caused pride in our hearts and it's caused us to look down on other folks, and that should never happen. I would like to read this to the top of my lungs. In the streets of Corinth, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. In the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he's deceiving himself. But let every man prove his own work, 
and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we'll reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, and we've got some opportunities, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them that are of the household of faith. I've told you this morning that criticism is going to come. I believe if it were possible that the closest one to Jesus, the disciples, I mean, that was his, that was his close buddies. That was just about as close as you get. They laid down everything and followed him. I believe if it was possible for them to escape the criticisms of the world, that the Lord would have helped them to do that and told them how. But he says it is impossible that offenses will come. And when we come up short, and do things. How many's ever heard? I knew that wasn't going to work to start with. You ever heard that? He was a little too big for his britches. He was a little too gung ho about that. He ought to come and ask me. I told him that. I could have told him that. Anybody ever hear that? I've seen people smarter than he was try that and it didn't work. How many ever heard that? Well, I hate it for them, but they made their bed. They just well sleep in it. I remind you that Jesus said it was impossible that criticisms would come. But woe to the one that does it. I want to read you just another quick uh, little insert from the Word of God. And then I want to finish up with a story. Woe is me. This is in Micah 7 and 1. For I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits as the grapes, grape gleanings of the vintage. There is no cluster to eat. My soul desireth the first striped fruit. In other words, I feel like I'm a washed out grapevine. They've jerked the fruit off of me. They've bent the leaves. They've bent the branches. They've twisted the vines. That's about what Michael was feeling like. He said, the good man is perished out of the earth and there is none upright among men. He was discouraged. They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. But they may do evil with both hands, earnestly. The prince to ask, and the judge ask for reward, and the great man he others his mischief, mischievous desires. So they wrap it up. The best of them is, a, is as a briar. He's, he's, he's pretty down and out. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of the watchman and their and their and thy visitations cometh, now shall be their perplexity. Trust ye not in a friend? I've got friends I think I can trust in. But Micah's upset. Put ye not confidence in a guide. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. He's even mad at his wife. For the son dishonoreth the father, and the daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemy are the men of his own house. He's discouraged. Therefore, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the Lord of my salvation. Then this next verse is one of my favorite verses. Rejoice not against me. It will be nice if we would all memorize this verse by heart. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. It is impossible that offenses will not come. But your enemies do not need to rejoice in your downfall. We don't need to quit because of a little criticism. We need to, we need to have just a little bit thicker skin than what we do. Jesus was just at the point of being crucified he had already went through the garden and prayed until his, until his sweat became great drops of blood. Judas had came up and kissed him. Here come the soldiers out to get him. And Peter draws his sword out of his sheath and whacks, tries to decapitate a man. He tried to cut his head off. 
the guy moved just enough where he whacked his ear off. And Jesus said, put up, put up your sword. Put up your sword. And he said, could I not at any time, any time I wanted to back out of this, Peter, at any time, could I not call 12 legions of angels from my father and they would be here immediately? If you're looking for an opportunity to quit, the devil's going to give you an opportunity. But what if the Lord would have quit? None of us would be saved today. There is value in criticism, and there is danger in too much praise. Now, this is the story I want to leave you with this morning. It's about two or three pages, but I think you'll get a blessing out of it. I got a blessing out of it when I read it. It says, quit, give up, you're beaten. They shout at me and plead, there's just too much against you now. This time you can't succeed. And as I start to hang my head in front of in front of failure's face, my downward fall is broken by the memory of the race. And hope refills my weakened will as I recall the scene, for just the thought of that short race rejuvenates my being. Now this is about a little boy that's, that has grown up into a man, and he is writing this. He said, a children's race, young boys, Young men, oh, how I remember well. Excitement, sure, but also fear. It wasn't hard to tell. They all lined up so full of hope and each thought to win the race, or at least tie for first, or if not that, at least take second place. And fathers watched from off the side, each cheering on his son, and each little boy hoped to show his dad that he would be the one. The whistle blew, and off they went. Young hearts and hopes of fire to win and to be the hero that was every young man's desire and one boy in particular whose dad was in the crowd was running near the lead and thought my dad will be so proud and as they speeded down the field across a shallow dip the little boy who thought to win lost his step and slipped trying hard to catch himself his flat his hands flew out to brace and amid the laughter of the crowd he fell flat on his face so down he fell with him, he couldn't win it now. Embarrassed and sad, he only wished to disappear somehow. But as he fell, his dad stood up and showed his anxious, anxious face, which the boy so clearly said, get up, get up and win the race. The little boy quickly rose, no damage done, behind a bit, that's all, and he ran with all his might that he might catch up from his fall, so anxious to restore himself, to catch and to win. His mind went faster than his legs, and he slipped again. He wished he had quit with only one disgrace. I'm hopeless as a runner now. I shouldn't try to win this race. But in the laughing crowd, he searched up and found his father's face, that steady look which said, get up, get up, and win this race. So he jumped up again, 10 yards behind the last. If I'm to gain those yards, he thought, I'm going to have to move fast. Exerting everything he had regained, eight or ten, but trying so hard to catch the lead, he slipped and fell again. Defeated, he lay there silently. A tear dropped from his eyes. There's no sense in running anymore. Three strikes, and a mind out, why try? The will to rise had disappeared, and all hope had fled away. So far behind, so error prone, a loser all the way. I've lost, so what's the use, he thought. I'll live with my disgrace. But then he thought about his dad, who soon he'd have to face. Get up, an echo shouted, sounded low. Get up and take your place. You were not meant for failure, son. Get up and win this race. So with a barred will, he got up. He hadn't lost it all, for winning is no more than this, to rise each time you fall. So he rose up to run once more, and with a new commit, he resolved that win or lose, at least he wouldn't quit. So far behind the others now, the most he had ever been. Still, he gave it all he had as he ran as though he would win. Three times I've fallen, three times I've stumbled, three times I've rose again, but too far behind to, ho to hope to win. <clears throat> they cheered the winning runner as he cr crossed the first place, head proud and high and happy, no falling and no disgrace. But when the fallen youngster crossed the line, last place, 
the crowd gave him the greater cheer for finishing the race. And even though he'd come in last with his head bowed low, unproud, you would have thought he'd won the race to listen to the crowd. And to his dad, he sadly, sadly said, Dad, I didn't do too well. To me, you've won, his father said. You rose each time you fell. Now, when things seem dark and difficult to place, the memory of the little boy helps me in my race. For all of life is like that race with ups and downs and all. And all you have to do to win is rise each time you fall. Quit. Give up. You're beaten. They still shout in my face, but another wise voice calls out, Get up. You can win this race. I believe we can make it, don't you? I believe we can win. Amongst the criticism and among the praise, I believe we can win. Let criticism, criticism be valuable to you. And be careful of too much praise. I'll tell you one more time what my boss said. You're never as good as you think you are, but you're never as bad as what others say you are. Always remember that. We may never be as good as we think they are, but we're not bad as a lot of people think we are either. I believe we can win it, don't you? I believe we can win it. Thank you for being in Sunday school today. <coughs> Welcome to our visitors and guests that are with us today. I'm so glad you came to Sunday school. Our hearts to hands is pork and beans and pudding mix. Hearts to hands is pork and beans and pudding mix. Bread of Life Banquet, if you hadn't signed up, if you read your Bible through last year, please do that. Now, let me make mention of our Valentine's Banquet. It is this coming Thursday night. If you have not signed up and you want to be a part of it, please sign up because we're going to buy the food early next week. We have no idea what to buy you. You can pay now or pay the night of the Valentine's Banquet, but sign up on the sign-up sheet if you have something in particular you want to eat. You may get chitlins if you don't sign up for a steak. <laughs> Anybody here ever eat chitlins? I have. They're not too bad. If you're hungry enough. But well, we'd like to feed you a steak or some chicken or a hamburger steak if you're coming to the Valentine's banquet. If you're single, you can still come. I mean, if enough singles come, we'll call it a singles banquet. So come, if you're sing even if you're single or even if your husband or wife is working, you want to come, you can still come. We'll have a great time. We'll all eat together and have a great time. Sign up sheet in the foyer. So if you're coming to the Valentine's Banquet, it's Thursday night, 630 in the Fellowship Hall. The women has been working in the Fellowship Hall, and it's, uh, it's going to be a very nice, very good Valentine's Banquet. You'll enjoy being a part of it, and we'd like to see you here. We have uh, a lower than expectations number signed up for this so far. So uh, we cooked some 70 steaks last year, and I think we're about half that this year, so or less than half that. So if you want to come, make sure you tell us what you want, and we'll, we'll get it fixed for you and get it ready for you. And that's this Thursday night. Thank you for coming to Sunday School. We've got about five minutes for a regular church. I'm glad you're here this morning.